Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone coming in. Yes, yet another session with Climate and Health Action for the Caribbean Health Professionals. It's so good to see everyone today. Hello, welcome. Yes, welcome. Welcome, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome. Welcome, the U.S. Welcome from Grenada. Welcome, Ghana. Welcome, all. It's so good to see everyone, and it's so good for us to be here once more to share. I can spend the whole day just welcoming everyone, but I know that we would not have enough time to hear our very eloquent speakers. So please come in. I know a lot of you have been here with us for a very long time from the very first session in 2022. And I know that some of you have been joining us today for the very first time, but have no fear, it's going to be easy and smooth going because you have an expert panel that will take you through all the steps. Sit back, relax. We are going to learn today how to best communicate the climate message to individuals in our community. We're gonna give people another 30 seconds to file in. As we welcome everyone again, it's good to see everyone here. Yes, please keep on joining us. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we're gonna get the show on the road because we do not want to waste a minute of what is going to come. So we welcome everyone to yet another climate action session. This time it's practical because we are going to hear from our health professionals. We are going on a how-to series. And today, we are going to learn how to connect with our community. And of course, we recognize our partners, Columbia, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, my own organization, Earth Medic, Earth Nurse, and of course, UE, who partners with us. I am Paula Henry, Dr. Paula Henry, and I am an associate of Earth Nurse, Earth Medic, and I would be your moderator for today. Welcome. So this how-to series, the goal of this series, which is a monthly webinar series, will focus on equipping health professionals with hands-on techniques, leadership strategies, and teaching tools for promoting climate action in different settings. Our learning objectives for today would be to understand foundational community engagement theory and how it can be applied to promote climate action in healthcare, communities, and government. To explore the work of climate action community groups and collaborative initiatives with hands-on experience in creating impactful change. We are also going to help you identify effective strategies for leveraging your role as a health professional to engage and advocate for climate action with a focus on health equity. So everybody's trying to get some credits out of this and that's good. So the credits are for the Caribbean based participants. You are going to be allowed one CME credit for this session and only CARICOM participants may apply. The application is made by completing the CME survey link posted in the chat before the end of the session. And this link will remain live for 24 hours after the close of the session. But we want everyone to fill out this link, not only if you want CMEs because you're going to give us feedback that is going to help us to make this course even better for you in the next iteration. And without further ado, I am going to introduce my presenters today. We have Dr. James Hospitalis, and we have Yvonne Lewis and Esquire Henry. So I'm going to introduce everyone together. And then you will hear the wonderful presentations from these three expert panelists. So Dr. James Hospitalis is a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, a lover of nature, a person of faith, a father and a grandfather with 30 years experience in public health, 
in the Caribbean, USC, and UK. He was director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency from 2013 to 2019, a coordinator chronic health disease prevention and control in PAHO WHO in 2006 to 2012. In 2020, he founded the Earth Medic and Earth Nerd Foundation for Planetary Health to mobilize health professionals worldwide to address the climate crisis through training, research, advocacy, and partnership. Dr. H, as he's affectionately called, is an honors graduate of the UE in medicine and an MSc from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's also a fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health. He has published more than 100 papers and reports and writes for the G7, G20 on climate and health. No stranger to us. Welcome, Dr. H. And then we have Yvonne Lewis. The name Yvonne Lewis is synonymous with health education and health promotion in Trinidad and Tobago, where she has given over 30 years of service. She transitioned from the Deputy Director of Public Health and Health Education in 2009, Ministry of Health, to end her tenure as the Director in 2020. For the past 14 years, Ms. Lewis has been teaching at the master's level in her field, including the MPH program at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. An expert, she served and is still serving on several national, regional, and international communities. WHO, PAHO, Partners Forum for Action on NCDs, the National NCD and Hearts Oversight Subcommittee, MOH, Ministry of Health, an expert, par excellence in her field. Welcome, Ms. Lewis. Last but not least, we have Esquire Henry, he's a passionate youth coordinator, advocate, and community leader, known for his impactful contributions to youth empowerment, climate action, education, and public health. He is the National and CARICOM Youth Ambassador for Antigua Barbuda, a member of the UN Youth Advisory Group for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, and a member of the Caribbean Development Bank's Future Leaders Network. A bright future ahead. Let us give Mr. Henry a warm welcome. And so without further ado, I am going to let, well, stop sharing now and let Dr. H tell you all about the framework for community. For community. Thank you, Dr. H. Are you ready to share your slides? Thank you, Paula. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be uh, with, with, to see you with us again today uh, as we embark on this how-to series, <clears throat> how to engage the community being the first one, and we have other good ones coming up on how to write a policy brief, how to engage the media in climate and health action. So I'm going to um, just share my screen. And our first presenter this evening um, was supposed to be Dr. Simone Charles. Uh, unfortunately, Simone's mom passed away yesterday. So I am pinch hitting for her. It's not a phrase I'm so familiar with, but I gather it's a baseball phrase where you popping in to help uh, with someone who is unable to. So we hope that all her arrangements she flew back to Trinidad last night, and we hope all her arrangements work out. It's, it's not easy to lose your mom. Um, so I'm actually presenting on her behalf, and I will uh, share my screen now. So is that uh, is that showing up? <clears throat> Haley, is that working? Yes, looks good. Thanks, thanks. 
So in the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes, uh, less than 15, hopefully, we'll talk about some of the effective strategies for community engagement. And again, I credit uh, Dr. Simone Charles, uh, who is from Trinidad originally and an associate uh, professor at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, with uh, she, she prepared this presentation. Now, when we talk about community, we, we all use that word, or most people use that word, but what does it mean? Uh, in the most basic sense, it's a number of individuals who share a common interest, uh, a background or purpose that gives them a sense of uh, cohesion. And often you have different characteristics, but they are uh, joined by certain social ties. And interestingly, a person's um, person's uh, uh, community can change over time. And any one of us might belong to several different communities. You might have a community of your church. You might have your workplace. You might have a sports group that you play with. And you might have a neighborhood group. So it's very easy to be members of several different communities. Uh, in public health, uh, a community is absolutely essential to success. And there's no major uh, public health initiative or I dare say environmental initiative for changing things for the better that did not involve uh, communities. It, it's a fundamental concept uh, to, to uh, success in, in public health. It's an important determinant of health outcomes. Pan American Health define um, community as a group of people who share common values and a community is a place where people live, work, play, pray, or share common beliefs or needs. So those are some of the, 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 the different ways in which you can see a community. So a community is not only a geographic one, a village, but it's also the workplace it could be a faith-based group. It could be a community a community service uh, organization. Every group has its own uh, culture and norms, and anyone can take the lead in this. Um, there are ac academically there. Are, I've been talking about a systemic perspective uh, that that a, a, a community can belong. A community can correspond to different, um, you know, where you work, where you where you live, and so on. But there are social ways in which people can be socially or politically linked and form a community. And of course, nowadays, um, more so, there are virtual communities. The Earth Medic and Earth Nurse Organization is, is an example of such. We're a virtual community. All, all of our associates, uh, directors, um, uh, and staff are virtually linked into a community interested in mobilizing health uh, to tackle the climate crisis. So <clears throat> attributes of community engagement, it's, it's a process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people who are geographically together or have a special interest. In our case tonight, everybody here is interested in climate and health uh, and how to, uh, to, to, to reduce the adverse impacts of climate change and also how to seize the opportunity to improve health. So there are similar situations that, that we're, we're faced. Uh, it's a vehicle for bringing about environment and behavioral change uh, involves, often involves partnerships and coalitions that bring together resources, influence systems, uh, change relationships, and serve as catalysts for new policy or program or, or practice. Um, thinking of, the, of, of some of the situations we face in the world, not all communities are necessarily what we would um, think of as having a noble purpose or a good cause. Some some people get together for, let's say, not good causes or uh, destructive things in, in our society. There is a, a, a considered to be a, a continuity of engagement in 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 in, in engaging a community. And you see on the slide here, outreach, consultation, involving, collaborating, and shared leadership. And so this speaks to a continuum. <clears throat> Over on the left with outreach, you have some community involvement. Maybe you communicate to inform, as opposed to the other extreme 
of bidirectional uh, relationship and shared leadership. So this outreach approach will provide some information to the community uh, and it, the purpose is, is really to, to, to inform the, the community. That's a minimum. That's what it, you can't have community engagement without having at least this minimum uh, uh, level of effort. Consultation is often part and parcel of community engagement where there is a bit more community involvement and you try to get some information from the community, perhaps do a survey or have a focus group to get some information on exactly what's, what's going on. Involving, you're deepening the bi-directional communication, you're getting more participation with the community on, on different issues and with each other. Sometimes when we bring people together, you often find there are even different interests within the same community. So you part of the job in bringing people together is to help broker and, and create a synergy between uh, different interests in, in, in the group that's been assembled. And then we come to a word collaborate or partnership, perhaps, where there's increased uh, bi-directional uh, communication. And communication is two ways. It's not just uh, telling people something, but it's also listening respectfully to a different perspective and suspending our own judgment sometimes if you're really going to partner. Uh, just like if you're in a, a romantic relationship or you're married, uh, you have to listen to the other side and perhaps sometimes adjust uh, your views um, as a result of that bi-directional communication. And in talking about communication, bear in mind also a lot of communication is nonverbal. So when you, the what is one of the difficulties with the virtual environment, it's sometimes hard to see people's body language. But in bi-directional communication with, with people, you often have better chance to read their body language. And some psychologists reckon more than half of uh, communication is nonverbal. What people, what people don't say communicates a lot. And so if you're in this business, you pay attention to people and their body language and see how what you're saying is received. And then the, the, the final would be sort of shared leadership where you're really looking to uh, uh, share the decision-making and, and you're not uh, di dictating it or deciding it all on behalf of. You're listening to the community because they have their knowledge, people have their understanding. Um, and that way, uh, trust is built up uh, to, to, to achieve whatever you, you're setting out uh, to achieve in, in climate and health action in this case. The benefits uh, for the purpose of this talk, obviously a shared agenda that is mutually beneficial to, to the parties involved, um, the design and speed of processes. Uh, sometimes I find uh, from my experience that the speed is not as fast as you might like. You might have somebody pushing you to do something, but if you respect this process, it takes some time. It takes time to build up some trust. It takes time to have develop a relationship so that the communication actually works um, uh, in, in, what, in what, what you're trying to do. Implementation and capacity for change is, is another one. You perhaps would not be able to do, do it yourself, but by getting the community together, uh, a, a village, um, a faith-based group, a sports group, you're able to bring about change that you couldn't uh, do uh, by yourself. In fact, you need everybody together to, to achieve it. Ethics, uh, improved ethics through community engagement and shared knowledge and enhanced understanding of the issues and building of capacity. So those are some of the, the benefits of community engagement. There are barriers to this kind of process, uh, including <clears throat> perhaps a history of problems in, in, in the relationship. Some, some groups are uh, have been bitten more than once, so to speak. Some groups are, are overstudied. Some communities become, uh, everybody wants to work with them and they, they get a bit tired of people coming to them. Uh, sometimes people have come to work with the community 
and they go off with the intellectual uh, property and, and write a paper or give a give a talk somewhere else and they haven't uh, first of all shared it with the community who helped to generate that uh, information time is always a constraint uh, we never we never have enough enough time and as i've said this process inevitably takes some time so you're not going to go one day and by the following day or following week achieve uh, a lot of things um, that might might need to be achieved, but it, it takes some time. Resources, financial, technical resources might be a barrier. Uh, perhaps the community doesn't see the benefit of what you're trying to do. It, it may seem awfully important to you, but if the community cannot see the benefit or if they cannot see the relationship to their big problems, then uh, that that is a barrier. And uh, we've perhaps been at the receiving end of that ourselves where somebody comes to us with a project to involve our group and in your mind you might be thinking well how's this going to help us uh, it might help you but so one has to this is where the listening part uh, comes in uh, so much and lack of a relationship in fact I, I posit that a good relationship is essential if there is if you don't have a relationship it's really difficult for community engagement to work. So spending time on this is, is important. And that relationship might be just something you share in common. You went to the same school, um, you have a, a, a similar sort of belief. So you have a relative in, in common or you lived in the same place, but don't underestimate the time uh, of investing in developing a relationship because that then gives you something in common the person can relate uh, to, to what you're trying to do in engaging a community. So striving to understand the other person's point of view is pretty important uh, in, in this. Um, Philippians 2.4, which is one of, my, one of my bits of scripture, talks about, you know, don't only think of yourself and your own interests, but think of the interest of the other party that you're talking to. It does not say don't think of your interest. You, you must but think of what the other person is also interested in, what they're wrestling with in working to develop uh, an engaged community. So here are some of the action steps to, to, to engage community. Think about what, what are the purpose and the goals, which, which community are you talking about? Uh, bearing in mind there are, there are different types of, of communities. Getting to know them, establishing relationships. That's what I've been stressing, building trust. And sometimes you can make a mistake and break the trust. Don't be afraid to say, I am sorry, I got that wrong. That was not my intent. Uh, so you 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 don't try to, to ducks when you've made a mistake, but but put it, yes, I'm sorry. And that's what humility is about too, as well, being able to say, I, I, I am sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, I didn't have that intent when I said that. So sometimes if you're working with a community, they're gonna have a slightly different view of the world and value system. So this part's important. Making long-term commitments to community partners and not just in and out, but stating and, and working with them to show that, that you have a longer term interest, sharing responsibility, perhaps building a, a coalition, uh, agreeing leaders, who's gonna do what in, in the steps recognizing the diversity and uh, the value that comes with that, the different assets that are gonna be in a community, including their expertise. Um, certainly in my younger days, uh, I went into communities thinking, I not that I know it all, but uh, you know, doctors are trained to diagnose and prescribe, and you think you, you know everything, and more than, than I, I got humbled several times until you learn to, to pause, suppress yourself and listen adapt to meet needs and building support, build and support a community's capacity uh, to make decisions and take action. So those would be some of your action steps. Whatever people's motivations involving uh, meaningful participation requires uh, respect and listening to and learning from. Uh, so here are a couple of models and we have the references around these, community-based uh, CBPR, community-based participatory research, Youth Participatory Action Research. We're going to hear a little bit later from Esquire, uh, who is focusing on the youth side. And then the, the various models of community engagement um, are include uh, 
models around, you know, how do you get a community organized to face an emergency? Uh, the Red Cross, and the Office of Disaster Preparedness, your local government counselors, your local governments, they're going to be much involved in that sort of level of preparing to face uh, an emergency, which with climate change, we're seeing more and more uh, extreme weather uh, uh, that 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 we have to we have to deal with uh, to prepare a community uh, for the, the the big one for us would be hurricanes, but there are others. Floods um, is perhaps the most frequent of the climate related impacts that we're seeing. Um, community resilience and strengthening community resilience case studies in that area. Another example is 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 the whole issue of energy uh, justice and uh, working with communities to to have a, a, a just transition. So with that, um, I've I've tried to put a few hooks there for you to hang things on around community engagement, and we'll be hearing next on, on some case studies uh, from Yvonne and from Esquire that illustrate, I hope, some of these points. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. H. That was brilliant, seeing that you were put on the spot um, and that you're able to deliver such an eloquent um, lecture. And also, I would like to thank you for helping us to remember that this is a process, because as you said, sometimes you want to also get it right the first time and you're anxious and you're engaging with the community, but you want to see the end result. You want to see the impact. You want to see it now. And you have told us, no, wait, wait, it takes time. We need time to build trust. We need time to build relationships. And, you know, that is important when we are coming together as a community. And we also know that we, as professionals in the field, we are trusted to deliver the climate message. So we don't want anything to go the wrong way. We want to, as you say, we want to engage, to encourage, to bring out the leadership potential in all the people that we're going to interact with in our community. And I just want to say that right here, we have a great community, a global community. We have people from Africa. We have people from Europe. We have people from South America. And we have people from so many different Caribbean islands. So it's good to be in community. It's good to share. It's good to learn from each other. And it's good to empower each other. I know you all cannot wait to hear Yvonne Lewis. She is a powerhouse. I mean, Dr. H is, you know, we know he's a powerhouse, but Yvonne is a powerhouse in the sense that um, she has a lot of experience with working in communities, in rural communities. She has taught people, you know, how to manage the environment, how to prepare for what is to come. She has empowered and given people the leadership skills to now do what they need to do in the community to be able to engage this climate crisis. Well, I am not going to say any more because I know you all are waiting to hear and she has a lot to say and I'm waiting to hear from her too. So what I can say, give it away, Madam Health Expert, Education and Promotion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ola, for that in introduction. I am humbled by it. And I want to say good afternoon to everyone online. I look forward to the next 15 minutes when we will share on a particular intervention that was implemented in Trinidad and Tobago that really looked at how to connect and amplify community voices for health. We did this in initiative from a healthcare perspective as a health team. So I will focus on how you and I as health professionals can do can do this. I must say, um, I no longer am with Ministry of Health. I'm happily retired, but I'm with the University of the West Indies and happy to represent them here today. So the example we are going to look at is something that is called Healthy Communities, Healthy Spaces Initiative. And this was done in a uh, rural village called Plamita in Trinidad and Tobago. 
It was done by a partnership of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, the Health Education Division, Ministry of Health. At the time, I was a health education officer and then I became director. And we had several partners, including PAHO. Now, in terms of what we did and how we facilitated this, we utilize a particular framework, and this is a framework that you can utilize as you work with communities on the issues of climate change and health. And this, this framework is called the Healthy Communities and Municipalities Framework. It's free, open source by, by PAHO, so if you would like to use it, you can access it uh, through PAHO. What this framework seeks to do, and I think it, it synergizes with what uh, the Global Consortium on Climate Health and, and Change wants to do, it, it promotes health and sustainable development, but together with people and communities in the settings where they live, where they work, where they play, where they love, where they study. So it's a settings approach. And I am I, my area of expertise is in health promotion. So I can say it's a settings approach to health promotion. Okay. Uh, it seeks to establish and strengthen a social pact among people so that we don't do this uh, alone. I, I will tell you, I come from public health and population health. And so I'm not uh, like the doctor that has a patient in front of them and deals with an individual. No. We deal with groups of persons, different types of group, and sometimes you have communities within communities, okay? So it, it establishes and strengthens a social pact among people, community organizations, health authorities, public, private, civil society. It's a pact together, all right? So it's not a sector, but it's a pact. Um, it supports development of local initiatives. And I know this is one of the things that um, Global Climate Change and Health is seeking to do, the consortium. So it supports the development of local initiatives, but it has a focus on elevating local management and community participation. When you use this, this methodology, the expert, if you, if you want to call us that, and I don't call me that, the expert is not left holding the stick. You actually pass the baton on to the community and you have to build capacity to enable them to take that baton and run with it. And then critically important, the use of local pl uh, planning and social participation. So these are the key uh, elements in the healthy municipalities and communities framework. You build, and some of these, I feel like I'm repeating because Dr. Hospitalis mentioned some. You start by building public commit, commitment, okay? You engage and you build commitment to improving the quality of life, not necessarily to a project, not to an issue, but to the quality of life of the people in the community. And then you seek to strengthen the community strengthen community part participation at every stage. And I will show you some of the stages we use at the planning stage, the implementation stage, and very important evaluation, because many times we do things and walk away and we pat ourselves on the back. Good job. But we haven't evaluated. And we also have to build that into communities that you evaluate and you, and you monitor the progress of what you do. We develop together strategic plans to overcome the obstacles and threats that have been identified, but we, did, we do it in collaboration, in collaboration with the community and with other partners that we will identify, build capacity. I cannot uh, overstress how important this is because sometimes we go into, in, into communities and, and we seek to engage them in action, but when we, when we meet them, they are at a different point. And sometimes we have to build capacity for them to engage, for them to lead, all right? For them to be able to do things like situation analysis. They may not know what those words are, but we can build capacity and we can 
hold their hands and engage together. Facilitate leadership. This is a critical part of the healthy municipalities and communities framework. Because leadership does not remain with the expert. We are health prof professionals. I was a director of health promotion. You may be a, another director. And, and we, we come from a place of leading in the health sector. But in, in the case of the community, we want to build them so that we could facilitate them stepping into leadership role, them participating and, and also holding hands and bringing other sectors. We must also, if we have to be evidence-based, we must engage in m &E. before, during, and after. And at the end of all of this, we need to continue the process. Dr. Aid says sometimes we run off and we write a paper, et cetera, but we have to continue to advocate and we advocate together. Advocate for healthy public policies at the local, regional, and national levels. And this is what the framework looks like. So you can look for it online. You can look for the healthy communities and municipalities. Um, we had used the mayor's guide and we actually implemented this in collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization in Trinidad and Tobago. And the example I will share with you now shows how this was done. So stage one, you must start somewhere. And you know, let's start at the very beginning. It's the very best place to start, one song says. And you start by looking for opportunities. I can tell you in our case, we started scanning. We scanned our networks and we scanned various channels. We scanned in the health sectors and in the units of the health sectors, okay? And in our case, we were having our monthly county meeting when the chief public health inspector said, you know, there's a community that we're engaging with right now. Uh, we've gone to the homes and we found every home positive for the Aedes mosquito. And that is a threat for dengue, all right? And he said, we need to do something. And the public health inspectorate came up with, well, let's do a barrel cover project. Why a barrel pro cover project? That community did not have portable water supply. So they, were, they had to store water. So the public health people came up with a solution. I'll tell you about it a little further. We scan public meetings and consultations. You, they are always these things happening, happening. If you are into climate change and health, find yourself in some of these meetings. And in one particular meeting, in our public board meeting, Plumita came. And Plumita said, we do not have a health service in our community. We do not have uh, pipe-worn water. And we are having issues in terms of people coming down with certain mosquito-borne diseases. They show themselves. And you can scan other channels, newspapers, social media, radio. Um, look at your internal and external stakeholders. There's information there that can help you to identify a, a community that is amenable for working with on these kinds of issues. And once we did that and we identified uh, Plumita, we started doing our research because we had to learn about the community. What's the history of this community? And when we looked into the history, we found that community had a lot of agency. As, as grassroots people, they had organized and they told me very clearly, Miss Lewis, we got uh, electricity to our com community. We did the remonstration and and going to different um, agencies to make sure we had we had roads. We they felt that they were able to, and we respected that. So learn your community. It's a community with a lot of agency. The other thing we did in our research, even before engaging them, we found out who were the people working in that community, both from the formal and the non-formal sector. We found there were government agencies in there, there were NGOs in there. There were grassroots people in there. There were business people in there. The private sector was there. So we began to do a, a, a mapping of the, the persons who facilitated or who you could talk, think of as stakeholders in that community. And after these two steps, 
we began the process of engaging. How did we engage? Well, from the list of persons we found inside of there, we began engaging with groups. As I said, there are communities within communities. So you had the village council, yes, but you also had women's group. It's a farming community. You had farmers associations, okay? We found out who were the leaders and power brokers from the research part. And so we began having what I call focused conversations with those persons, all right? After the focused conversations, we got a sense of what the community felt was their need. So these were the felt needs, okay? And then, of course, we now want to go in and we, we're coming with a particular project. PAHO has asked us to implement the Healthy Communities and Municipalities Initiative. So we did community sensitization that would introduce them to what this is. We didn't tell them you have to do this. We're introducing them to this methodology that is all about improving the lives of people. After that, we went into joint needs assessment because this is the point where we both will identify needs. The grassroots identify their needs. The experts identify their needs. You're going to have community felt needs and you're also going to have uh, what, what you can call more assessed needs from the experts. All right. As we were looking for opportunities, I would have gone through some of these things. You, we did the public board meeting, we got some here and we found they really needed, wanted water. The PHI, they had, they wanted to reduce mosquito-borne mosquito diseases, okay? Uh, the, health, the health authority wanted to work to support population health right there. So we saw an entry point for engagement as the confluence between the felt needs of the community and the assess needs, okay? So it's a little bit about Plumita, rural village, uh, population about 2000 to 2005, located in the interior of, of, of Trinidad and Tobago, where there's a swamp, they're in the middle of a rainforest, okay? This is some pictures of Plumita and you can see issues of flooding they had, we found them having issues in terms of water storage. The farmers, sometimes their crop would be lost due to um, flooding. They felt they should have uh, groundwater because they were so close to the river swamp. All right, they have walking trails. This is part of the, floor of the forest, their schools. This is a monkey that you will see if you're driving on the road, okay? So it's this beautiful verdant place. So when we did our research, these are some of the the agencies and that we found there. We found some non-formal non agencies like the, the village council. We found NGOs. This was um, FPATT, Family Planning, Diabetes Association, Cancer Society, National AIDS Program, the Rotary Club, Farmers Group. We found there were people there and there were some formal agencies there, the health sector, the Regional Health Authority, Ministry of Health, PAHO, the National uh, Drug Abuse Prevention Program. Education was there. YTEP is a youth entrepreneurship program. WASA, that's the, the Water Authority, local government. There were people there. So you know what happened? We knew that as we went in to do this particular project, we had a community. We had a network of people there that we needed to con connect with. We are not coming to supplant. We didn't go to do something new and forget everything that was going on before. So very important, learn about the community, its history, and identify who's working there and make linkages with them. And then we, we went into the social mobilization phase. This black thing is not helping me here. Yeah. Stage two is social mobilization. All right. Connecting with the community, which is what we're about here today. So we identify the community groups, but when we identify them, we look for leaders and we look for power brokers. Sometimes the power brokers are not necessarily the leaders, as was the case in Plumita. We had the secretary of 
the village council a very simple housewife. She was one of the biggest power brokers because she, she could have gotten the, the community to move. And then there was a gentleman who, was a, who had a fish farm. I think he provided some employment here and another power broker. So when we engaged, we make, made sure we included the leaders, village council, etc., but also the power brokers. And we held the focus conversations. We held a number of community cons consultations and village meetings. You might say, why? Why after doing focus conversations, you're going to go into community consultations? Because there are communities within communities. There was the population of young people who said, when we went in, we want you to engage us separately. And so we did that, all right? There were women, all right? A lot of women in that community and they had a women's group and they wanted us to come and engage them. So we had several community consultations. Sometimes we had full village meetings, okay? Then we did the, the community sensitization on the project we wanted to introduce and mobilization. So we presented the project. That would be the healthy communities strategy. Okay. But then you don't stop there. You present it. They may not uh, just buy into it. Okay. So what did we have to do? We had to build trust. We had to ensure that every time we went into that community, the community was at the table. So we gave the chairing of every consultation to the village council, not to us, although we were coming in. And so we gave them that leadership role from the beginning. And when we wanted to do the situation and analysis, we also invited the community to do a situation analysis. So we, we will do one, but they do one also. And very importantly, when we do this, we, we, the part of building trust as we continue is the sharing. So if you call us from health, the expert, the health authority presented the community health situation for Plumita. People were seeing their health situation as a whole for the first time. And we could have presented their health situation as a community in terms of what were the issues, um, in terms of child, child health, in terms of environmental health, in terms of so many different aspects, okay? And the community, remember, in building trust, we asked them to share, to, sorry, to do a situation analysis also. So in the sharing of information, we did a forum where we both shared the situation as we saw it. One, we could have called it assess needs. The other one, we could call it felt needs. But listen, the perspective of the lay person and the lay knowledge is just as important. And so we had to build a bridge so these two things could come together, all right? And, and at that same meeting where we, we shared the two, we did the, the sensitization of the strategy. After that, having the situation from the expert and situation from the, 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 the layperson, we did joint needs assessment. So we didn't, we didn't uh, identify the needs alone. We did it jointly again, respecting the community and at every stage, keeping them in a leadership role and inviting them with us to prioritize the needs and the concerns and then to get consensus on what we were doing. This is giving you a, a slide from back then. This is what the community saw as their needs back then. They wanted reliable, portable water. They wanted medical services. They wanted skills training program for youth. They wanted recreation area for children, community health education, training and employment issues. They also wanted to develop an ecotourism uh, industry. Okay, because of where they were. We did not have, well, probably we had the medical services on and the health education on in terms of our needs assessment. Their needs assessment was different, but we had to take it on board. So for stage three, what, we, what would we do now? This is where we're gonna do joint planning and organization 
with the community, all right? So we have this strategic alliance that we, we began developing. And at this point, we start broadening the partnership and including some of those other agencies when we did our research that we found there, okay? We started also, so we brought a partnership together now and started doing local strategic planning for the development of project proposals, okay? And um, we organized intersectoral teams, teams that brought together the lay person, um, us from health and persons uh, from public, private, and civil and civil society who were working in the, in, in, in the community or who could support the development of the projects, okay? And of course, mobilization of resources. And this is what this is what happened. The local healthy spaces com committee was formed, okay, with the village council forming the core and including other uh, community members. We yeah, we had an identified health team counterparts, okay, and they developed five subcommittees. We also got together and we made uh, an agreement in terms of what it is the community would work together on. And this is what happened. This is what came. This Youth Affairs Committee came up because I told you the youth did not want us to treat with them with everybody else. And so we put together, this is the youth. I was the counterpart to the youth. The recreation part. Again, we put the, all the people in white, they are community members. And this person here is the chief public health inspector and myself, we were counterparts. They wanted water. Well, health can't do the water thing. We absolutely can't. So we got another partner involved and that is the Water and Sewerage Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. And so they came in and they identified someone who would be a counterpart along with the chief public health inspector and go on and on. Aqua Farm Committee, that was the private sector person. Okay, and in stage four, in terms of, of building this community action and amplifying their voices, the community empowerment board, because as we went along, we realized they needed skills. They needed skills in hosting a meeting. They needed skills in understanding all about monitoring and evaluation. They needed still skills in, in, in planning, although they would have had lay skills. So we sought to strengthen community skills, all right, to facilitate their participation and facilitate them being in leadership roles. We, we trained community members. And what was lovely, we trained them alongside ourselves. We were a regional health authority. So if we were training secretaries, we brought their secretaries on board. If there was a training going on in, in an area that's related to the project, whether it be uh, climate change and health education in this case, you brought them on board with, with you, with us, all right? And then we started uh, moving towards community action on uh, priority areas with the in intersector, intersectoral support, okay? That's the other stakeholders we had found there and those that we invited. So with that, this I, I wanted to give myself just 15 minutes. I think my 15 minutes is up. So I wanna say thank you very much. Um, this gives you a synopsis into how we utilize the healthy communities and municipalities framework and how we operationalized it in the context of a community to bring about change. I'll say two things to you. That project that you saw there, the Prime Minister awarded it a Prime Minister award, not because of me, but because of the people. They called me to receive it, I called the people to receive it, and they went and received their award. That's one. Two, time is a factor. This did not happen overnight, and it will not happen overnight. But I can tell you, in 2017, one of the projects that we started in 2003 came to fruition and they had now a youth, a community center and a dedicated youth development center in this rural community. And that partner that we call WASA, Water and Sewerage Authority, 
they stayed the course and over a period of about nine years was able to bring water from very far away away in Matura, lay pipes and bring water into that community. How did that happen? Because we engaged the community and enabled them to be able to amplify their voices for change. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. I Is Dr. Hospitalis wanting or needing to say something? I wonder if I could allow you. Yes, no. Okay, so let me just say this. You were, no, please don't give us your profile pictures yet. We want to see you a little bit more still. So you you have memor mesmerized me. I, I, you're bringing, you have brought tears to my eyes. Um, you took us down a uh, very slow. We we were able to engage with you every moment of the way. So I think I would like to summarize this by saying, how do you build the pie, right? And the pie, the P stands for planning, the I stands for implementation, and the E stands for evaluation. How do you build a pie? Think about it. Now I'm a woman. I have been married for forty five years. And you know, it's the same. How do you build a pie? And at the end of, like in my case, 45 years, you actually have productivity and you see this pie growing. In this case, it's my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren coming up just now. So as you said, take time. When you spoke about the planning, you know, you could see you just, you're just not reaching to implementation. The planning had to involve listening um, to find out what, okay, as you say, the situational analysis. Okay, so what do you want? I know what we think we want, but what do you, what do you want? That type of engagement, that building trust going very slowly in the P phase of it, the planning phase. I mean, we, we, are we have lived this with you as you are telling us about it. You know, I, I could go on and on, but you know, it, it was so rich, so hey. rewarding. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions. Um, so I don't want to go on and on. I want to give people enough time to ask the relevant questions so that they can now engage in their community to make impact when we would need it most. Yes, in 2030, 2050, we are going to need that impact by sowing the seeds now. And just one more thing I have to tell you. I like the idea that you had a picture with school children children in the classroom. I mean, you had the community, yes, yeah, but you, you also brought in the school children and the fact that the youth wanted to have their own forum. Yes. So it was very engaging. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. Anyway, uh, we have to, <laughs> thank you. So right, so now we are going to go on to um, our youth ambassador, Esquire Henry. We can't wait to hear I can't, and I'm sure you could not also wait to hear from him because, you know, I think the youth, they are really the future of the world. I mean, we know that. So I'm going to stop now and I'm going to give it over to Mr. Henry and take the reins and please, please tell us all about what you have to share. Okay. Thank you so much. And I do share the same sentiment. The previous presentation was so lovely. And I'm very happy that she was able to highlight some, some of those important discussions, especially when she mentioned um, discussing with the community and ensuring that persons don't just feel like they are being a part of the project, but have the opportunity to lead. And so this is why I want to present on reaching out, engaging with your community from a youthful perspective. And I know that I'm a bit young, but I have been in youth leadership for quite some time and I've been able to execute a number of climate change and health projects. And I just want to outline with you five steps from the design thinking approach that has really helped me in executing these projects and activities within my local community. And the first step that I want to really highlight, and some of these would have already been mentioned before, but I just really want to irrit irritate them because they're so important to execute projects within your community. And the first is to empathize. And we want to really understand the issues that impact our communities and environment. Because we sit from a different perspective. Sometimes we're in an office, sometimes we're not always outside. And so we really want to understand what are the issues that impact those people who live within the area. And in order to get that done, there's several approaches that you can take. And one of these approaches is to have open discussions. And you know, 
one of the ways that I found very effective in my execution is to actually walk around the village and engage with persons who sit on the block. I also have conversations with youth leaders, schools, and members of churches. What I found is that these young people bring very fresh and innovative ideas. And sometimes when I discuss with them, they tell me things that I personally would not have even thought about or even knew existed. And I also had the opportunity to utilize technology. Our research is extremely important. And you know, we saw earlier of the importance of doing surveys, um, conducting interviews, and as well as looking at organizations such as PAHO, WHO, and your local Ministry of Health to see the issues that affect a community that you may be interested in. And of course, you can always observe and communicate with members who live within that particular area, because again, they're the one who understand the issues most and they are aware and they're responsible for the environment. And so they best can tell you what goes on. And, you know, sometimes when we think about solving a problem or executing a project, we always think of it from the perspective that we have to address an issue. But I want to tell you today that it's not always that case because we have the opportunity as well to be proactive. We can also put measures in place to protect the environment before certain circumstances do take place. And you can find out these things by just simply watching other communities, seeing what's taking place in other areas. As you saw, we had a lovely presentation on a project that was executed. And perhaps, you know, some of these could be implemented within your personal community to avoid those problems um, coming forward. And in order to fully flesh out and understand the issues at hand, you have to create a problem statement. And to create a good problem statement, it must be clear, it must create awareness, and it must stimulate creative thinking. And if you don't know what a problem statement is, and I doubt that you know most participants would not know, but if you do not, I can want to tell you a problem statement is a sentence that summarizes or explains an issue to be solved or researched. And so, you know, not everyone wants to be underground to execute a physical project. Some persons are more strong in executing projects from a more proposal perspective or even just to do research. And this is so important as well because it's research that informs actions on the ground. And when you're developing your problem statement, I encourage you to ask the who, what, why, and how. So for example, you know, you may realize that a beach in your particular area is filthy, but then you have to ask yourself, who is littering? How does the garbage end up on the beach? Why are they littering? And how can you remove these littering? And this is so important when you develop a problem statement because it can help you to come up with a more clear and concise solution and help you to orient when you're setting your goals. And it's important for you to set SMART goals. And you know, to set a SMART goal, it must be specific, measurable, attainable, or achievable, realistic, and most importantly, time-bound. And I know some of us may have these extravagant ideas and want to execute this large grand project today or tomorrow. But in reality, you know, that may not always be the case. And so I always want to encourage persons to start from a, a point that you think that is achievable for your goal, that's achievable for your team, and that you may have the relevant resources to execute because that is so important. Because without the right resources, you may not be able to get as much work as you want to get done. And if your goal is unattainable, trust me, after some point in time, you may feel overburdened or, you know, you just may feel like you're not achieving it. But I just want you to set goals that you know you can achieve. And when you achieve those goals, because I do believe in you, set them a bit higher, set them a bit higher, set them a bit higher. And that is how you'll be able to execute a very strong project within your personal community. And I also want to, the next step in the design process is idea. So idea basically represents you coming up with an actual solution to the problem that you would have identified before. And in order to come up with that solution, as you would have highlighted earlier, you could conduct research or you could utilize solutions that are obtained from your empathizing process. So, you know, when you're discussing with persons in the community, they will tell you some of the solutions that they may have for their issues. However, they may just not have the resources to execute it. And that provides a perfect opportunity for you to come in and create a project or solution to solve that um, problem without having to you know redevelop a new idea or create a new solution and also if none of those work you still have the chance to brainstorm because you never know you might be able to come up with some creative ideas to address the issue within that particular community and finally you have to have the opportunity as well to create a prototype and to test that prototype and that simply means coming up with the actual project itself executing it see what works and what does not work and if it doesn't work, try again, 
because it's a process that takes trial and error and you have to continuously go at it to achieve the process that you want. And now I just want to share some of the projects that I would have executed from my time and as well as give some recommendations on projects or simple one-off events and activities that as nurses, you may be able to execute, execute within your specific um, community or community that you have a strong interest in. And so you will see in the photo, myself and some other national youth ambassadors. And what we'd have done is to partner with a local water company called The Water Story. And on that particular day, we were able to distribute 300 water bottles to persons in town. And that was so important because leading up to the event, we had a number of heat warning and as well as um, the rising temperature. And it was very, very bad. And so, you know, the members of that project was very happy that we were in town to distribute those water. And that initiative didn't take much. It was really just a matter of reaching out to that entity and asking, hey, are you able to partner with us to execute that project? And so sometimes in order to create a big impact, it could take small effort. And we're just fortunate enough to be able to execute that activity. And as nurses, some of the activities that I would recommend or you could even look into executing is, for example, if you could have health impact or climate education projects within particular schools, you also have the opportunity as healthcare workers to maybe look into making the hospital um, waste free or make it um, sustainable when you're executing uh, the project. So for example, you could reduce the waste within the hospital. You could have a proper recycling management system on certain wards. And these are important because it helps to protect the climate and it also allows you to contribute and also teach patients the importance of climate change while they're there. And you can engage, engage with youth through school health programs because we love hearing from you nurses. And so and it's always wonderful when you reach out and have those level of talks and community engagement with us as students. And in the picture here, you'd see on the right, we also I would have been able to partner with an institution called Janssen Empowerment Institute. And what we were able to do there was to educate around 20 young students from a local secondary school about climate change and as well as teach them a bit about project management. And at the end of the program, they were able to develop their own community ideas. And we provided seed funding for those individuals to go back into their community and execute programs. And I think this particular school would have done a agriculture um, initiative, which benefited the community and as well as contributed to their health. And that was a very impactful program. So you can see, they were very helpful to be a part of the, the whole workshop. And you know, it had great impact on the community. On the front side, we had a fun engagement with Adopt a Coastline. And essentially what we did was to have a partnership with the University of the West Indies, High Valence Campus, Adopt a Coastline, and as well as the Department of Youth Affairs. And they would have placed recycled tires on the beach and used them as bins. And here you see them painting the bins, the tires blue. And then afterwards it was assembled. And now we currently manage those bins to a partnership and that was a very wonderful initiative because they allowed the youth to have that level of engagement and it was a fun calming activity that assisted them to relax as well as making a contribution to the environment. Also this slide now is really just encouraging you or rather providing some recommendation when you decide to engage youths uh, because sometimes when youths are engaged they're not fully involved or the, uh, there's a recommendation that was created, a project that was created, but the youth was not consulted, and therefore the impact of that project was very minimal. And so, you know, I really want to encourage you when you're designing and coming up with ideas, and especially if you want the youth to be one of your main target area, um, you could invite some of the youth to co-lead and co-design those projects uh, with you, because as I mentioned earlier, we're very innovative with coming up with solutions, and we are able to share our perspective and recommendation. Also, when executing programs such as workshops or other educational events, consider the number of resources that you can actually provide. Uh, I know from my experience, when transportation is provided, meals, and as well as incentives, uh, the participation rate can go extremely high. And also, if you're able to preside, uh, provide materials from the sessions that they can follow up on afterwards, those result in some very wonderful impact and allow for some continuity after the project is over. And it's also very important for you to adapt to the environment that you need, adapt to marginalized youth, and also consider youth who may have disability and who may have um, learning challenges. And on the right, we have been able to execute a project with the Villa Primary School and another company called Janserve. 
and essentially this project was to manage the uh the the, the waste management system for females who are in, um encountering their period cycle and so they're able to dump their uh, used tampons pads etc into these bins and they're properly disposed of to you know, minimize the hazard as well as the um you know the waste going into the waste management system because prior to this um some students were flushing their used use feminine sanitary products down the toilet, which clogged the system and affected the waterways. And, you know, just some final advice. I really want to encourage you to be very mindful of the community structure and culture when you're going forward to engage. So some of us come from com communities with indigenous people. And, you know, some of these communities may have chiefs or they may have um, community leaders who, before we execute a project, it's very important to dialogue and conversate with them before entering the communities, just because they have a different culture and structure and how they choose to execute things. Also, if we could get, um, you know, just have conversations and consultations with important stakeholders. So if you're going to engage with the school, you know, ensure you have parental consent as well as consent from the Ministry of Education if there's a need for that. Uh, you know, and we mentioned this earlier, and it's so important for you to just show genuine interest and respect for the youth ideas as well as to foster a long-term relationship so uh if you're just interested in doing a one-off interaction that is completely fine but there's also measures in place that, that measures that you can put in place to ensure that you're able to follow up with them perhaps having a fun activity afterwards or even having a online um, session just to see where the participants are at and to really analyze the impact of the project afterwards there are also some other information that I would share with you um, when you're executing projects. Keep a record. It's very important for you to keep a record because at the end of the day, um, someone may come after you and may have a similar idea and you having those records and able to provide it to them allows them to have a greater impact and also, also allows you to see the progress that you have been making throughout the time and see areas in which you need to improve for your next projects. And these are the 10, 11 best practices that you could follow. And you could also just read them through the slides afterwards, as I would post a link that you may be able to access this slide, but they're so important when you're executing the project just to stay on track. And I really want to thank everyone for listening to, to me, and I really hope that you utilize this opportunity to engage with youth within your community when you look forward to executing your next project. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant, Mr. Henry, brilliant. You know, I began thinking, so we started off with a very broad base and I felt like it was a funnel experience where now we would get the drips coming down the the um the purified um product and this is what um Esquire did for us, right? So he distilled it, you know. So um Dr. Haas, Dr. Eight started off giving us the broad framework and then we went down to to um Yvonne and you know she she gave us you know so many facets to deal with but she told us that there's it's a community within a community remember that and so this is what Esquire did for us right he said you know what don't become overwhelmed by a huge big community and all that needs to be done find the project find the problem but the same tenets that Yvonne gave us is the same principles that we now had to apply in this community within the community, okay? We had to pay attention to the culture. We had to pay attention to what the people wanted. We had to, to amplify their voices, right? We had to give them leadership potential. So, I mean, this has been such a rewarding and fantastic experience. Um, there are not many of us, and but there are a few questions here. Um, thank you, all the panelists, for putting your mics on, because we need to start right away with the questions. I, too, need to get some of these answers. So I'm going to start off with some of the general questions, and um, whoever thinks that they can answer it, feel free to jump in. Okay, so the first question asked is, how to deal with conflicting views in the community in which you are working? Well, I, I probably would share what, uh, what happened in our case, because in our case in Plumita, 
we started off <laughs> with con conflicting views. There was an expert viewpoint and there was a layman's viewpoint. And we had to deal with the intersection between the expert and the lay person. And I had to, behind the scenes, work with my health colleagues to let them understand that when you're promoting health of people, we don't go to supplant, but we go to empower, which is the bedrock of health promotion, empowering communities to achieve well-being. Yeah? And to step back a little bit and let the community voices be heard. When the community voices uh, came forward, even within the community, there were differences. And that's the whole thing when now we get together. We talk them through, we look at the pros and, we, and the cons, and we help them to understand, let's use a decision-making strategy to come to consensus on where we will move forward. So one of the key things there is that we shut down nobody's idea. And everybody was able to put their idea on the table. There's some, some people supported some, some people didn't. But every idea came to the table. And then we discussed it. And that whole thing of building consensus and getting to a decision, we learned to do that together. It was enabled because we also tried to build trust. We never left Planeta. We still have it. All right. But back then, we held hands. And we made sure, I think, putting them in the leadership role, respecting the head of the village council, who was a simple man, a farmer, and putting the CEO of the regional health authority to sit as a member of a, of, of a meeting, not, in, not at the head, that said something to them. And they were willing to, to engage in the whole process and to make some, all of us have to make um, concessions and to make concessions so that we come to a consensus. But that, that's what we did in this, in this case. Thank you very much. Very well explained. Okay, this one, I'm not too sure, but I was asked it anyway. What lessons did you learn about yourself in the example you gave? I'm not too sure which example, um, if that rings a note with anyone, what lessons did you learn about yourself? I there's so many examples, so I don't know if we could pin anyone. That's why, that's why you want to take that one. Yeah, I was just about to boy. I saw um James Mike was unmuted, so I'm not sure if he wanted to respond. So you you go, go ahead, Aspire. Let's let's okay, hear great. the voice of you. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I really would have learned um while executing the project specifically. Um, the one with the water story was that the project requires requests requires some some real strength. Uh, you have to be resilient because um, you know, although it's it's sometimes easy to execute a project, there's a lot of nuances that happens in the background that you have to organize and arrange, and it also requires a lot of patience. And I, I learned that I was very patient while executing these projects. Thank you. Thank you. And so there's another question. It's for you as well, Esquire. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest strength of youth engagement in climate and health advocacy? How can others support this effort? I think one of the greatest strengths uh, actually is the reality is we're the ones that would be impacted by all these climate events. Um, we're the ones that have to face the consequences and come up with the solution. And that's why it's so important to engage with us because we're current, we're, we're living through it, and we would be providing the children who would also live through it and continue that legacy. And we create the ideas, we have that fresh mindset. We, we may not know it all, but we do know the things that affect us and some of the solutions that we want to see. Thank you very so the much. The way to support because... us is definitely engaging us in those kind of conversations. Thank you. Because what you're speaking of here is sustainability. And we know that for anything to achieve in this um, emerging climate crisis with health at the helm, we, sustainability has to be at the forefront of everything that we do. So thank you for that. 
Okay, so this one is, what is the one piece of advice that you would give to health professionals that are, in, that are interested in participating in community-led initiatives? There is one advice they ask for that you would give to health professionals that are interested in participating in community-led initiatives. Just one. <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> Whoever, Dr. Hospitalis, or maybe yeah, I'll, Yvonne. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt an answer I mean, with, way, with um, a reflection on some of the earlier questions about conflicts. Um, so the one piece of advice I would give is don't think you know it all. Just because you're named doctor or nurse or master or PhD. And the example I would give is uh, some years ago working with the uh, tourism industry and trying to get uh, action on the problem of, of outbreaks in the hotel industry. And I went for about two years, I was knocking on the door and I went to uh, meetings of hoteliers who have big egos. And I would talk about um, disease uh, problems in the industry. And those people got real vexed with me. They cussed me. And the reason is my language was frightening them. They thought they would lose customers. They would lose business, which is their raison debt to, to, to stay in business, to make money. So the lesson I learned was the importance of framing or reframing. So when I reframe the problem into improving profitability through attention to health and hygiene, there was an audience. People would listen. But when I was talking about preventing disease as the first sentence, they got frightened. And so it, it was a humbling experience in a way. It took me about two years to realize that I didn't necessarily, the way I was seeing it wasn't necessarily the way it, to present it in order to get action that was needed. I had to put myself in their shoes and frame it in a way that they could relate to. And then the action actually would be the same or very similar, but I had to put myself in their shoes. So thank you. Yeah, so listening and letting everybody's views be heard. So you're gonna get the entire perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, Haley is reminding me that the link the google link is in the chat please we want everyone to fill that out because the questions that we are asking you there would help us to get better at what we do so we could serve our this community a little bit better so thank you everyone please start filling out the um the google link as it appears there and you know it's only going well it's going to remain live for 24 hours but still you can begin filling it out now now, this next question is also a very good question. What would you do differently if you had to do it over? And the person asks barriers, question mark. What would you do it differently if you had to do it over? So I guess this is to um, Mr. Henry and to Ms. Lewis. Um, we want to hear from both of you. Because, you know, we, we like to learn something new from everything that we do. You know, if I had to do it over, I think what I would do differently, I have to spend a little bit more time in the health sector. Because I because of my training and, and, and orientation, I, I did my oh. master's looking at... Um, how communities develop curricula for their own development. So I, ha I have a focus and a passion for community development. But think about your county medical officer of health who run in a whole county, how much 18, 20 health centers, the nurse who thinking about this department. The community is not necessarily the focus. It's, it tends to be more individual, you know, the patient, or as Dr. Hospitalis says, the issue. Dengue, is that an issue? Okay. NCDs, that's an issue. And, and we have to learn how to focus on population health and well-being. And so I, if I did this all over again, 
I would start at home. I would start at home because in the back end, a lot of work had to be done in terms of getting health professionals to buy in, to give in a community the leadership role. It's not normal. We're the expert. We sit, them, we sit down and we tell them what's wrong with them. We tell them what to do to get better. We tell them it's, that is our, it, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. But you see, reorienting that, it was a bit of a task. It didn't come out in the presentation that, that although you were doing this type of work with the community, trust me, you had to do parallel work with the health sector because the health sector is filled with experts, with people who know. And so if I, if I were to do it again, I would prepare my people for engagement and then then go forward, you know, and, and engage the community. That's one thing I would change. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what do you have to tell us, Mr. Henry? I'm certain that the one thing I would change is to keep stronger records, especially as more persons are coming after us now. Yes. I'm looking to develop similar projects. Having stronger records, like, for example, a simple contact information as who you reached out to, or even involving more information on the challenges that you faced. Because what you would find is that even though you would have encountered a particular challenge and would have overcome it in your time, someone coming after you would encounter something extremely similar. And we tend to leave those information out. And so just including those kind of guidance so that the person can follow this procedure, um, who to reach out to, what to do when you're stuck, uh, just involving those particular documentation, I feel would have made a very stronger impact in continuity. Very important. And now with the technology, it should be easier and easier for us to do. So I think I can slip in one more question before we close. Don't forget, please um, register for our next session. We're going to have that. But I'm going to ask slip in one more question. And then I want everyone to put on their cameras and whoever can, can take a screenshot of everybody. That would be fabulous. So the last question that we're going to take for this evening is, how can health professionals best uplift and empower community voices? Bring them to the table. Thank you. Give them a seat at the table. And we have many tables. Quite often when we go to the table, we are speaking to ourselves. And this whole thing, bringing lay persons, communities, NGOs, civil society, I think one of the things that we've got to embrace a little bit more is that collaborative mindset where we work in health as public, private, civil society, linking our, our, our hands, our resources, our capacities, etc., together towards promoting health of all patients. We don't have to do it alone. And I think that as a health sector, really, I mean, we know our business and all of that, but it doesn't matter what it is. Bring them to the table. And I think that will make quite a difference. Thank you. So that's a good place to end. Bring everybody to the table. Bring give all them a the seat. Give it, you, can't, you can't give everybody, but at least give them a seat. When you're meeting, I can tell you right now, I am working and I'm saying you're treating, you're, you're developing something with uh, looking at NCDs in the country. And when you look at the people around the table, there's nobody from the informal sector. You can't do it. Their perspective, the lay person's perspective is important. Their assessment of risk is important. All right? Health, risk, all of these are social constructs. And we need to understand what, you know, is their, understand, their perception of it. All right, and, and bring that, that in as we try to problem solve. So I think we, we need to just create an extra seat at the table. So we're mm -hmm. going to try to do that now to bring everybody into the table. But just I just want to share my last slide so that we can have more engaging 
conversations like this in the next few months to come. Let me see if I could share screen again um, to just bring on the last slide. Um, has stopped a shared window is closed. What does that mean? Um, let me try again. How to connect. I'm going to try one more time. And if I don't get through, Haley, well, okay, I, I am getting through. Okay, so our upcoming sessions next month, Wednesday, on Wednesday, October the 16th, we have another session communicating the climate message with your patients. So we're going to drill down with that. And then in November, we are going to be communicating the climate communications with the media. So please join us for that.